Okay, thank you. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Thumbs up. I believe so. We're good. Perfect. It uh, is 1.02 p.m. on the 13th day of October. Hopefully everyone had a great Thanksgiving family weekend. Awesome, awesome weather in Muskoka and I think across the province. But uh, officially like to call this meeting to order. Uh, we are waiting for Councillor Nishikawa to join us. Uh, I think she's the only one. And Councillor Roberts, I stand corrected, but uh, they have not indicated they wouldn't be here, so would be joining shortly. Um, I do also today want to acknowledge that we're on lands traditionally occupied by Indigenous peoples, and it's Indigenous peoples that have cared for this territory for the benefit of future generations. Their stewardship throughout the ages is certainly recognized, and today I happen to be wearing an orange shirt also. Um, we uh, did not receive any public comments for today, but we do have a supplementary agenda item. Councillor Zavitz is having a hard time hearing. He can now hear. He's unmuted. There we go. Um, <clears throat> we do have a, a supplementary agenda to have a couple of uh, invited delegations, and that's uh, regarding item 4D and 8C, um, a uh, engineer, and mostly regarding the Burgess One Dam uh, municipal class environmental assessment. At this point, I'll ask uh, Council whether we have any declaration of pecuniary interests. Councillor Hayes, I'll get you to unmute yourself. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I have um, a pecuniary interest with a closed session item and I will give more information when we are enclosed. Thank you very much. And have uh, I believe there's a form to fill out. Have you advised the clerk and filled out that form? I have not filled out the form yet, and I will as soon as I can find it. Okay, not a problem. We'll have the uh, deputy clerk uh, send you that form to be able to fill out just uh, from a paperwork. It's a new procedure, obviously, that we are following. Uh, any other declaration of pecuniary interest today? <clears throat> I am seeing none, so we will continue on. We've got a, uh, a couple of uh, invited delegations today, and the first of which is uh, Anne Wigowski. And uh, maybe we can bring her into the meeting. And this is uh, regarding an action item 6A, um, or agenda item 6A, but uh, action item one, which is the license agreement application. And I believe for uh, council's uh, recollection is regarding some tent or tents or winter tent access that we're gonna be on a road allowance. <clears throat> I believe there's been a solution found, but we'll have uh, Anne provide us with comment before we move on with the meeting. I don't see her in the meeting yet. Is she in the waiting room? She's knocking on the back door of the meeting and uh, but she's at the front door. Um, okay. Just trying to find her. And I have to say, I actually just found out, I didn't realize this, but uh, you know, as we're in Zoom technology and we're past the flip phone era, apparently William Shatner, as we speak right now, is up in space orbiting this Earth. So will wonders never cease? And uh, here and now we will be having our council meeting today. <laughs> uh, I would also like to say, by the way, uh, great meeting this morning, Councillor Zavitz. Uh, appreciated to have a lot to get through and uh, a fine, fine sharing job this morning. So thank you for that. Um, there we go. Anne is with us <clears throat> and we will get Anne to unmute her microphone and uh, make sure you don't have a, a speaker on in the background, but uh, or just on your computer. So you're live Anne, the floor is yours. There we go. Can you hear me now? We can go ahead. Okay, so I know uh, quite a few of you were at the general and finance meeting, so I don't really think I should go through the whole history of uh, how we got here. Just to report on some progress, we did after that meeting, um, Councillor Bridgman and I met with Mr. Pink, and we took a look at the property and we've identified an area at the north end of the property where we could add some fill and um, be compliant with respect to erecting a more permanent solution. There's definitely um, plenty of lot coverage available for that. And uh, that'll entail moving the septic bed a little bit. So I'll have a permit 
coming in for that. And I'm talking with Muskoka Lumber about some of their existing uh, two-car garage designs at the moment that are compliant, that um, have actually been through and approved by the bylaws team. So I have a solution underway and our landscaper is uh, getting ready to fill that area. <clears throat> and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do something by the time the snow flies. If it, of course, we only get the filled area in and we don't have um, construction underway to keep the snow off the cars. I, I still think that there should be some solution other than um, having to apply for a minor variance to put up a couple of car tents for the winter. But um, that, that's the progress so far. We'd still like to proceed with the licensing arrangement for where uh, the area that we do use for parking. So that is all good and kosher. And uh, that's where we are. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council, any questions of Ms. Uh, Wangowski? And thank you very much. Thank you for working with our council and uh, our staff to try and find a solution. Uh, I can personally recommend a garage design by uh, Muskoka Lumber. They did mine. And, um, but I think the other short term, if you do get the fill in that uh, wherever that new location of the garage, you could obviously put your uh, temporary tents on there for the winter time, as long as all setbacks are appropriately covered off. So you should have a solution for this winter, uh, save and accept uh, providing some for some fill. So, um, that's great. And we do appreciate it again. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to some action items at this particular point <clears throat> as we move on our agenda, because I don't need that in particular. Um, and that is, I have a resolution moved by Councillor Bridgman, second by Councillor Edwards. Be it resolved that the mayor and council adopt and enact the following minutes and recommendations contained on the October 13th, 2021 consent agenda and direct staff to proceed with all necessary administrative actions. And that is uh, number one, September 15th, General and Finance Committee meeting minutes, action items one to six. I'll talk about action item seven in a second, which is not included in this. Uh, number two, September 15th, 2021, Council meeting minutes, September 16, 2021, Planning Committee meeting minutes, and action items one to eight. And October 5, uh, 2021, Special Council minutes. Any questions or comments on the resolution? as read. Uh, Corey, I'm gonna come back to item number seven or did you have an item, because I know that we wanna talk about uh, action item number seven uh, at a, under a different perspective. Um, we're not recommending that at this particular point. Did you wanna speak ahead of time? Uh, it's in regards to item 6A, correct? The consent agenda? The minutes from the general finance committee meeting? That's correct. Um, item, I'd like to pull out item uh, 8A from uh, that agenda in regards to the resolution for the MOUs with the two volunteer libraries in Milford Bay and Walker's Point. Okay, uh, uh, Mr. Murray, we have actually done that already on your behalf. Thank you for that. Okay. Uh, we're actually only enacting items one to six right now, and we can deal with action item seven, which is uh, as you requested. Okay, so perfect. We'll head a pause on that. Councillor Jagowicz, you have a question? Oh, yes, Anne just spoke to us. Is her um, matter being pulled out too? Uh, if I may, and I can confirm with the clerk, but I believe that uh, Anne's item is still in there. We are denying the license of occupation at this particular, we're approving the license of occupation for the parking lot. However, we are not approving the temporary shelters on the road allowance. So she's aware of what's going on. And it's exactly as we decided last time, she's found an alternative for the uh, parking structures. And she's good with us. She's good with that uh, coming forward and being passed. Okay, that's thank correct. You. Thank you, and thank you for bringing that to our attention. <clears throat> Any other questions? You've all heard the resolution. All those in favor? Madam Clerk, I believe that carries. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Corey, I'll bring you back up because there was one other action item in our uh, General Finance Committee, recommendation number seven, and that was a memorandum of understandings regarding our Walker Point Library in Milford Bay. Do you want to speak to that quickly and then we can read that resolution? Perfect. Yes. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Council will, will recall at uh, last month's committee meeting, staff were uh, directed um, to look into the insurance piece uh, regarding those uh, memorandum of understandings. Um, currently, we are still working uh, with our insurer on clarification 
um, for those. So we would uh, recommend uh, amending the resolution to exclude the Milford Bay Library and the Walkers Point Library from that uh, ratification at this time. And uh, once we have a, a path forward completed, um, we can bring that uh, back to council for ratification. Okay. Committee have any, or council, excuse me, have any uh, questions regarding this? So I have a resolution moved by Councillor Kelly, seconded by Councillor Mazan. Be it resolved that September 15, 2021, General Finance Committee recommendation number seven, which is the Memorandum of Understanding 2021 operating grants, be enacted for action as amended to remove the Walkers Point Library and the Milford Bay Library. Any further comments? All those in favor? And Madam Clerk, that again is carried unanimously. Thank you very much. We have a couple of uh, <clears throat> resolutions uh, moved from uh, the last uh, general information session uh, a month ago. I have a resolution that's moved by Councillor Bridgman, seconded by Councillor uh, Zavitz. Be it resolved, Township Muskoka Lake supports the municipality of Chatham Kent. Resolution of August 9th, 2021, regarding affordable internet. And Councillor Bridgman, I'm not sure if you want to speak briefly to this or not. Um, I would, uh, um, Your Worship, if you don't mind. Uh, just for everybody's information, the federal government made some more money available for the for uh, internet, rural internet. And what happened was Ontario also had its own initiative and they offered to take the federal portion of it and, and put it into one big pot. But what has happened is that the first, the first round of it is only for fiber optics. So that negates most of us. And they only allowed the three or four big players. They were the, the smaller um, internet uh, providers were not even allowed to bid on it. So this is really, really important because as much as they talk about rural internet, nothing is happening to make it happen for us. Happen, happen, happen. Anyway, I just wanted to give everybody a bit of an update and a background on that. And then I'm going to ask Corey at some point if he would update us on what the district's doing, but that may be under new business, Mayor Harding, whatever you whatever you prefer. Let's deal with it under new business, if we may. Any other comments on this resolution? All those in favor? That is carried. Thank you. I have another uh, item that was referred from uh, General Finance <clears throat> last round. And is a resolution moved by Councillor Hayes, seconded by Councillor Edwards, be it resolved that Township Muskoka Lake supports the Township of Tay Valley resolution, August 24th, 2021, regarding lottery licensing to assist small organizations. And I'll turn to the mover first of all. Councillor Hayes, did you want to speak to this resolution? Uh, thank you. Currently, the only people that can apply for lottery licenses are nonprofit organizations, which are a lot of our uh, bigger groups. The smaller groups like hall boards, community libraries, community groups are all left out as well as one time events. This would recognize um, the, the, uh, the smaller organizations and allow them the ability to apply for a lottery license like 50-50 or bingos or anything like that. So I think this is a, a move in the right direction and may take a little bit of, um, of stress off of our uh, granting committee. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Council, any questions of Councillor Hayes as the mover on this? You've all heard the resolution. All those in favor? And that carries as well. Thank you very much. Uh, IT, <clears throat> let's move along in our agenda here a little bit. We have uh, a report from Director of Financial Services, uh, RFP for IT. Uh, Director Donaldson, do you want to give us a quick overview of this report? Thank you, Your Worship. So Council will recall that last year uh, it was approved to, to do a one-year extension with our current IT service provider, Near North Business Machines. Um, we are coming up on the expiration of that agreement. Uh, we also have done our, uh, are in the process of wrapping up our IT strategic plan, which will come forward to committee uh, next month. And, um, and that will uh, lay the foundation of what our longer term five-year plan will look like in terms of our IT objectives. But in the meantime, our uh, imminent um, uh, primary concern right now is just to ensure we have continuous IT support services available to us. 
And this uh, RFP will be informed by some of the preliminary findings we've had in our draft report already uh, that uh, council will see in its entirety uh, next month. So this is, this is a request to go out for call for proposal for IT service uh, for up to three years with an optional two-year renewal, depending on the bids that we receive uh, at council's uh, uh, approval and, and uh, moving forward with that as quickly as possible so we can have all our contracts signed by the end of uh, 2021. Okay, thank you. Questions? Uh, council, any questions regarding this? Councilor Roberts. Thank you, Chair. And through you, I have two questions um, to uh, uh, Director Donson. Um, in, 20, in 2017, um, the uh, Council elected to uh, bring in house uh, IT support. I'm wondering during our exercise of this past little while, did we val do any validation that that was the, uh, a really beneficial thing to do? Thank you. Director just Donaldson. ask you, I don't have anything. I'm just wondering if we looked at that. Director Donaldson. Thank you, Your Worship. So, so the consultant was basically hired uh, during the, the scope of the RFP to really kind of give us a where we are today, not to, not a, an in-depth look at where we've come from or, or what we've done. So there is a little bit of a history there, but there's been no validation as to whether or not the um, okay. the fruits of the fruits of that uh, change came to bear or not. That's not in the report. Okay, um, and the supplemental, a second question then, uh, Your Worship. Absolutely. Um, in, in the recommendation, it says the issue a uh, request for proposal for um, IT uh, um, maintenance and support. It also says that to amend the service agreement with Blackline Consulting to include advisory services related to um, content and evaluation of the request for proposal. Down, in, down under ongoing, uh, uh, ongoing um, the subtitle ongoing, I could, I, I may have misread this. It says the, R, the RFP will be prepared so to include services which are not currently contracted in order to address identified performance gap. Staff are also recommending that the current engagement, the amendment to include the provision of advisory services to assist with the preparation evaluation of the RFP. So it's the first part. Um, that my question pertains to: Are we amending the? Are we amending the, with this recommendation? Are we ask, also asking Blackline to do um, to address the identified uh, performance gap, or is that in the report that's coming in November? Director, thank you, Worship. So the the report will will clarify where there are performance gaps. When we brought services in house, as you noted uh, in your previous question. Um, some of those IT frontline services were to be delivered by staff, but with the turnover that we've had in some positions, um, those those roles have kind of um, they've they've become they've become there's not there hasn't been a, a good turnover or continuity I suppose of of that uh, service provider. So I think what we're looking for is to use Blackline uh, to expand the scope of the strategic review, just to ensure that our RFP fully captures the services that we need in order to ensure that we don't have any gaps in service. So we did have some responsibilities that were being held by internal staff. Some had been contracted out to near north. There has been a bit of a blurring of the lines over the period of the contract. And we're trying to ensure that what we go out to ask people to bid on will cover everything that we need from an outstanding, from a third party provider. Okay, Hope thank you. Helps. So it, yeah, it does help because what you're saying, what I gained from that is you're going to expand sort of the RFP so it really captures some of those gaps so we can get yeah. those addressed. Thank you very Correct. much. Okay, thank you. Council, I'm not seeing any other questions. So I have a resolution moved by Councillor Mazan, seconded by Councillor Hayes. Be it resolved, Township Council recommend to staff that staff be authorized to issue a request for proposal for information technology services maintenance and support for a term of up to three years, effective January 1st, 2022. And that the service agreement with Blackline Consulting be amended to include advisory services related to content and evaluation of the request for proposal and an incremental cost of up to $14,000. And finally, that the mayor and clerk be authorized to sign any necessary documentation. Any further comments? All those in favor? Clerk, we're carried. Thank you very much. Uh, director, thank you.
Uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Director Becking, I believe, is with us today. Oh, so we're a little ahead of ourselves. Uh, we're going to hold on that class. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Uh, where do we want to go? Uh, website search function software. Let's go to Mr. Moore. Corey. Oh, Ken, I think we're going to put a pause on the um, uh, Burgess One Dam at this point because the consultants, I think, coming at 145. So we'll circle back to you. Thank you. And uh, go to Corey regarding uh, report number uh, AD or 8D, Communication Economic Development regarding website search. Corey. Thank you, Worship. Uh, today's report uh, just provides an overview of um, some slight changes um, to our website uh, hosting agreement with eSolutions. We were notified um, via email that um, they would be changing our current uh, website hosting agreement in regards to the search engine function. Previously, they were a reseller of the Cludio software, and uh, they advised us that uh, moving forward when our agreement uh, comes up for renewal in November, that we would be dealing with Cludio uh, directly uh, moving forward. Um, so today's uh, staff report um, just provides uh, a recommendation to do that and uh, authorize the mayor and clerk to sign uh, those new agreements. Um, I think staff for the short term view this as, a, as the solution. Um, there is a, a slight increase in costs for year one, but uh, there are some increases uh, in costs for year two and uh, year three and so on. Um, so uh, staff have already uh, begun uh, looking at comparables uh, with the other area municipalities as well. Um, so that next year um, we, can, uh, we can decide uh, moving forward on a longer term solution. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Council, any questions regarding this? I have a resolution moved by Councilor Bridgman, second by Councilor Edwards, be it resolved that the changes to the hosting agreements for the Township's website search software as outlined in the staff report CED 2021-13 be approved and that the mayor and clerk be authorized to execute the necessary agreements and the final terms of said agreements to be, uh, be to the satisfaction of the Township's solicitor. Any further comments? All those in favor? Thank you very much. I will also just uh, comment on that as we're working on our website. Uh, and uh, Corey, maybe you can turn your camera on. Just uh, over the past number of uh, months, I think uh, council has had many questions about search function within our website, finding relevant documents, information for public notices, so on and so forth. So I, I do hope um, on an ongoing basis that we look at revamping and recycling our website to make sure we are continually ensuring best practices. And uh, I, I know that when we hit our search function, or I've found regularly when we hit the search function on the website, it takes us to a document page and goes automatically into uh, the back end. These are the bylaws, here's everything that's passed. It doesn't necessarily provide an option of where on the website things are found where the information is probably in the front end of the website. Anyway, I just, I leave that out there that we need to potentially uh, start to think of and address functionality and usability of our website. So no resolution, but just, uh, and as I see a number of councillors nodding as well, I think we've all at times experienced the same issues. So just wanted to make that noted. Thank you. Uh, okay, we have a few uh, short road allowances. Moved by Councillor Hayes, seconded by Councillor Jagowitz, be resolved that the following lands be declared as surplus. A portion of the original shore road allowance on Lake Rosso lying in front of concession eight, lot eight, Tobin's Island, Medora, designated as part two of plan 35R, 26434, Herbrook, rule 4286, and a portion of original shore road allowance on Three Mile Lake lying in front of concession eight, lot 21 watt, designated as part one on plan 35R, 26543, uh, Gledal. Uh, Roll 217.4, and that the clerk is hereby instructed to dispose of said property pursuant to sections 8, 9, 11 of the Municipal Act 2001, and further that road closure and conveyance uh, bylaw 2021-150 Herbeck and bylaw 2021-151 Gledal be read a first, second, and third time and finally passed. Any comments on our road closures or shore road lots? All those in favor? Looks unanimous to me, Madam Clerk. Thank you very much.
Uh, we need to annually appoint our members of the Committee of Adjustment. I'm going to read the resolution moved by Councillor Kelly, second by Councillor Mazan, be a resolved bylaw 2021-164 to appoint a member to the Committee of Adjustment. The Township of Muskoka Lakes Council member be read a first, second, and third time and finally passed. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Councillor Edwards, you're employed for another year. <laughs> Okay, that's there. Uh, consent applications. Uh, Mr. Sharp, am I missing something? I think we're on to Bryce for uh, consideration, consideration for consent applications. Welcome. Good afternoon, Bryce. Thank you, Your Worship. I'll try not to take up uh, too much of your time. I just have a, a bit to get through here with respect to amended conditions for a consent application that was approved by Council uh, last fall. Uh, to formalize development uh, on a property known municipally as 156 Medora Street with residential apartments. Staff have been working uh, diligently with the applicant and their representatives to fulfill all of the conditions of consent and staff are aware of the importance of this project, uh, not only for Council, but for the community at large. The file has proven to be uh, technically complex, uh, requiring input from multiple parties, in, including um, solicitors involved in the file. Uh, staff have received a request to amend um, conditions of consent, which will have the effect of restarting uh, the one year time frame under the Planning Act for fulfilling conditions. The amended condition will require a uh, easement in gross over the subject lands, uh, which has been identified as a requirement by uh, the two solicitors involved in the file. Uh, I have no concerns and uh, I would be happy to assist Council with any questions. Thank you. There we go. Council, any questions regarding this? Seeing none, resolution moved by Councillor Kelly, seconded by Councillor Edwards, be it resolved that the notice of decision dated October 14th, 2020, for consent applications B910 20 ML 2540158 Ontario Limited, Rule 538, be amended to state two, that rights of way and easements sufficient to accommodate all joint use facilities be included in all transfers, implementing the consents, including any easements in gross for access by emergency services and public works over the private roads and turnarounds. Councillor Jagowitz. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Just to refresh my memory, is, it, is this the residential development behind the, the commercial one? Um, behind SIP, is that what this is? Mr. Sharp. Uh, through your, your worship, yes, that is correct. Thank you. Okay, any other comments? I just wanna comment, I'm thankful that we have staff to uh, administer these technical uh, rights of way and everything else that go on because this is far beyond my pay grade when as I even have a juggle reading the language included in this resolution. So thank you for that, Mr. Sharp. Uh, with that, I will call the question, all those in favor. That is carried as well. Thank you. Um, what's that? Some bylaws? I think we're moving through today. <laughs> we don't need to have a break yet, do we? Um, okay. Uh, this is uh, to appoint a clerk for the Township Muskoka Lakes. We did meet our new clerk uh, virtually this morning. Uh, she's attending here. Um, I will also, I guess at this point, before I read this uh, bylaw, um, this will be the last council meeting that uh, Cheryl Mortimer uh, will be joining us uh, with today. She will be around for the planning meeting tomorrow. But uh, if, if I may, I, I personally, I know with a number of councillors around the table, have had the privilege of working with uh, Cheryl uh, for 11 years now. And um, from a professionalism perspective, from a dedication perspective, uh, from where you started here at Muskoka Lakes and where you're finishing your career, um, you are leaving a big hole within this township or this municipality. Uh, thankfully, will be served. Um, but uh, I, I cannot express enough my personal gratitude for your uh, care and dedication uh, and support for this community. Uh, and every staff member here, you consistently go out of your way to support everyone in this building 
as well as support all of the municipal taxpayers here. Um, your job, your role is not clearly defined, though it is defined, I meaning <laughs> you help everywhere as we go forward. So I personally, and I know Council Wadeko, I think the same, just want to say thank you very much uh, for an incredibly distinguished career. I see everybody clapping in the background there. But uh, thank you, thank you so much uh, on behalf of uh, everyone in Muskoka, including this council, for your service. Do you want to speak? Sure. Let's go. Cheryl wants to speak. Yes, it's hard to believe that it's uh, 34 years since I started here at the township, and it's um, been a very exciting career, starting as receptionist and um, working a little stint in the finance department and then back to legislative services. And I was given the opportunity to be um, appointed as deputy clerk and clerk. So I'm very thankful for all of the, um, well, uh, it's been a privilege and an honor to work for the Township of Muskoka Lakes and with all of the staff, all of the councils that I've been uh, affiliated with and the mayors and I just wanted to say thank you very much and I wasn't going to get emotional <laughs> <laughs> and you, I think you're in good hands going forward. Thank you for that Cheryl and uh, if there's one thing I think I noticed that the one area that has been left off your resume uh, Director Beckening, I think, has a, a space on roads crews. If in your retirement you feel like uh, patching some roads and helping out, then you can round out your full Township Muskoka Lakes resume. So uh, anyway, thank you again for your time. Um, I do have a resolution uh, to replace Cheryl, so to speak, <laughs> and that is moved by Councillor Zavitz, seconded by Councillor Bridgman. Be resolved that bylaw 2021-167 to appoint a clerk for the Township Muskoka Lakes and to repeal bylaw 2004-171 be read a first, second, and third time, and finally passed. 2004, I guess, is since you have been our clerk, based on that uh, math. So any further comments? All those in favor? And that is carried, though I didn't want to support that resolution. Just <laughs> let you go. We're going to have to let you go. So thank you for that. Um, OK. Uh, Oh, no. I, I, uh, I can do zoning bylaw, Noonan Macintosh, correct? Okay. Um, and uh, okay, I've still got a few minutes. Um, we've got our planning people back online. I have a resolution. I'll read it for first and second reading. Uh, moved by Councillor Evers, seconded by Councillor Hayes, be it resolved that bylaw 2021 82 to amend comprehensive zoning bylaw 2014 14 Noonan Macintosh rule 9812 be read a first and second time. Uh, any questions on this right now? We'll talk more between third reading. Uh, Councillor Evers, do you have a question? Yes, thank you. Uh, this has been very, very uh, controversial, and that uh, I've had probably um, a, a hundred um, uh, inquiries on it. And, and since this was an LPAP matter, they were asking, is there any way we can guarantee it? And I checked into it. And, and one way is to take a one foot reserve around the, the whole uh, uh, and that property. Another was to take a you know, one foot um, in that reserve on it so that uh, there's no future things. I just wanted to know what, what council thought of that because the uh, Leonard Lake Association are very, very concerned about it and that for uh, future uh, severances. And since it was a L LPAT decision limiting the lots, I just wanted to make sure that it was covered. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor Edwards. I'm going to actually circle back to that question after first and second reading, because I think that could be handled potentially differently. But I'll ask for first and second reading right now. All those in favour? Madam Clerk, we're carried there. And uh, Ms. Darling, maybe you want to kind of outline a little bit again, this was a matter of LPAT on uh, Leonard Lake. Um, and was there any recommended um, minor amendments right now? And then we can address Councillor Everett's question. No, there's no minor amendments. We didn't receive any comments after the public, like after the public meeting with planning committee. Okay. Um, 
So the concept of uh, concern for those on Leonard Lake, and I know uh, Councillor Roberts in particular, um, may want to comment. Um, from a feeling of protection, do we believe that we are protected or, and maybe it has to come to Mr. Sharp with this concept of a uh, one uh, foot reserve, um, whatever that works out to in metric, because I know we're supposed to speak in metric terms um, around uh, the property. Maybe Bryce, you can chime in first of all, and uh, then we'll also go to uh, Councilor Roberts, just for a comment. Thank you, Your Worship. I can try to speak to uh, the, the question. I would remind, um, Council that planning committee actually um, required an added condition of consent that required a, a consent agreement wherein the uh, owners would agree not to further subdivide uh, the lands. And by virtue of the applications, um, any further severance would need to come back to this council uh, for approval, just given the, the zoning on the properties. With respect to a one foot reserve, um, I may need to look to uh, Director Pink to provide some uh, some insight. It's not something that I've seen done here at the township uh, in my time here, at least. Um, there may have been one instance uh, with respect to an existing rural property where there was a, a one foot reserve that I believe related to a uh, an old um, uh, plan of subdivision. Um, so Mr. Pink, uh, perhaps you could uh, provide some insight in that regard and, and assist me, I'd appreciate it, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. I think it's also a good uh, reference, uh, Director Sharp, to remind us that we did add sort of the belt and suspenders approach because there is also the additional consent agreement. But Mr. Pink. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, a couple of things I guess I would uh, point out, and uh, Mr. Sharp correctly did point that out, that I think the municipality took uh, a number of measures to ensure uh, certainly a set of criteria uh, or tests that need to be passed of any future lot creation uh, application were to come in and as we heard uh, a consent agreement uh, whereby the owner would agree not to make a future application as well as the uh, zoning bylaw in front of you. Um, what, what I would note is that uh, I think there's some misconception uh, just because the uh, uh, formerly uh, LPAT now OLT approved of severance applications that that somehow uh, prevents a future property owner from making future applications. And in this case, they've adjusted a lot line um, and uh, we reviewed that and put a number of measures in place to ensure, uh, again, that if a future application comes forward, uh, there will have to be a number of measures that have to be addressed. Uh, one thing, uh, just on a purely technical note, um, earlier today, when you passed the action items, you've now approved the severance. Uh, what's before you uh, currently uh, is the bylaw itself. Uh, the bylaw itself will just restrict the new lots. Uh, so I think it's something you do want to pass. Uh, when it comes to this specific question uh, on a one foot reserve, um, I, 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 perhaps I need to have discussions with the Lake Association to see what they're thinking. I don't see how that would necessarily prevent lot creation that would prevent access to the property. Uh, and I'm not sure um, if uh, what the reasoning or the intention uh, of that uh, would be. I don't think we want to uh, create the lot and then prevent access to it. Um, what I would recommend uh, for council's consideration, a um, uh, number of applications such as these come in, they tend to be contentious, particularly on the small and medium lakes, um, but they do conform completely with our official plan and our zoning bylaw. My recommendation to council is if a lot creation on these lakes are a concern, that's something we should discuss during the official plan review process, as opposed to uh, imposing um, sort of out of the box thinking uh, roadblocks, so to speak, on, uh, on these planning applications. So I would suggest that these discussions take place as, as part of the official plan review. Uh, again, uh, short answer though, I'm not sure what the, the one foot reserve will do. I think council's put uh, a number of measures in place to uh, certainly discourage a future lot creation application, but nothing you can do to prevent it. Hopefully that helps clarify. Okay, it does. I'm gonna to go to Councillor Jagowitz first. I think Councillor Hayes, then Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you, Chair. Through you, uh, uh, to staff, um, you mentioned that at committee, it was recommended that there be the consent that the lots not to be further divided. Is that in the zoning bylaw? I don't see it. And if it isn't, maybe you could explain how that gets implemented and how, how, um, how will that ensure that there's no further subdivision? Mr. Sharp, over to you. 
Thank you. I can do my best to try to explain. So um, the lots in question would be zoned uh, waterfront residential, WR4. Um, and the, the zoning bylaw states that um, the minimum lot requirements for a lot with that zoning are the existing lot dimensions. In other words, the existing frontage and area. So to change that by way of a consent application or severance application, one would need a zoning bylaw exemption in order to um, proceed. So that's what I was saying, sort of by virtue of the bylaw and the bylaw requirements, um, the lots are essentially frozen unless otherwise approved to be reconfigured by council. Um, hopefully that uh, provides um, some the insight that you're looking for, Councillor. Okay, so supplementary, is that implemented by this bylaw in front of us? And, and then just as a uh, thing, we, I believe at planning committee tomorrow, I believe we have an application for one that is in that situation. The, 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 it is that way and they're asking for it to be severed. Is that not correct? Yes, you're you're both uh, you're right on both accounts. There is an application that Zone WR4 that need a, needs an exemption tomorrow, and in regard to this specific application that's under discussion, the bylaw will have that same effect. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hayes. If you'll recall, we did have um, one property that did have a one foot um, reserve on it, and at that time. It went back beyond the history of anyone that was here, and we weren't quite sure why it was there. I think having a, a consent, consent agreement sends a clear message that it was our intent that these properties would not be subdivided again. So I'm quite happy to go ahead with a consent agreement. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you, and through you to uh, staff, um, just uh, remind me, the consent agreement uh, gets registered on title. Does it survive current ownership? Mr. Sharp. Your, your, your worship, uh, that's a great question. And yes, it does. It will run with the land and it would apply to any future okay. landowners. Okay, that's good, thanks. Tip, typically, uh, I can't say that this would be done in every instance, but a, a good lawyer should be advising their uh, clients when they're purchasing the property through a search of title that this consent agreement does exist and they should be made aware of it. And of course, um, if applications were submitted in the future, um, staff would, uh, you know, review this history and identify that um, the owners were or should have been made aware of the agreement. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so we're there's no recommended minor amendments in this uh, prior to third reading. Councillor Everett, you did bring up the one foot reserve, um, but uh, just want to make sure you personally are satisfied that with the addition of the consent agreement registered on title. Um, and also hearing from our director um, that uh, not sure what the one for reserve other than providing or, pro or prohibiting access, if you will, uh, to the lot. Uh, I think that we're probably covered off. Want to make sure you're okay with that. Uh, that's fine if, if, if that's what council wants, but I can just remind them that we had the same thing. There was a bylaw on Ricketts Lake that was overturned and uh, they got lots. And that's so uh, this is why uh, it was mentioned to me and I thought I would bring it up. But if council uh, figures this is the way, but in the future it uh, can be set aside and it's unfortunate. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have a resolution moved by Councillor Mazan, seconded by Councillor Jagowitz, be it resolved that bylaw 2021-82 Noonan McIntosh be read a third time and finally passed. All those in favor? That is carried. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move on to our next uh, bylaw, and that would be Schultz Gibson. I'm going to read the first and second, and then we'll go to planning staff, Mr. Soya. Oh, we do have a delegation at two. So let's hold off on that one. Um, hang on here. I want to. Let's go. Uh, what about McCaskin? There's speakers on that. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Mr. Sawyer, thank you for uh, being there, but we're gonna put a pause back and we're gonna go back to uh, Mr. Becking and uh, regarding our uh, Burgess One Dam, I believe. Director Becking, oh, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Your Worship. Um, through you, uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Chris Stilwell, 
and Mr. Eric Giles of the firm of Tullock Engineering. Um, Tullock has uh, been conducting a class environmental assessment on the uh, what to do about the Burgess One Dam uh, over the past year, and they're here to uh, report their findings and make a recommendation for a technical, technically preferred alternative. And uh, with that, I think I'll turn it over to Mr. Giles to make his presentation. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Giles. Thank you so much. Uh, there you go. Can you guys hear me okay? We can hear you okay. Maybe speak up just a little bit louder. I know I'm having a little hard time, so it would be great. Sure, no problem. Much better. Um, I was just kidding. Like, I have a slide deck. I don't know the best way to show people is there if I, you want, I can just kind of talk through the, the I believe we have a I believe we have a copy of that same slide deck and we'll have oh, perfect. Uh, yeah, put it on the screen just tell us when to advance the slide awesome so we'll try and go through this pretty quickly uh, probably most of this I imagine you guys probably already know so the first few slides are largely about the environmental assessment process so what the aims are and what the goals are um, so obviously we're talking about the Burgess Dam uh, and if you keep going to the uh, next slide, basically an environmental assessment, oh, that's fine, yeah. We basically chose it as a class B schedule because it's largely uh, viewed as like a rehab um, project where essentially, you know, the existing dam largely is gonna stay in place, but we're gonna be looking at upgrading it. Uh, so if you keep going, uh, I think the, uh, the facility overview you can probably skip through that. I'm sure you guys know what the Schedule B project is. Um, the overall uh, Burgess Dam is kind of composed of two main elements. There's uh, the red line you can see um, is essentially the non-powerhouse section, which is a basically a concrete wall. It's about three meters high and it's founded on bedrock. And then there's the actual powerhouse section itself, which is about nine meters by 14. It's also built in uh, to the rock, both along the foundation on the bottom of the structure as well, uh, to the north side on River Street, uh, right into the embankment. And so it's about 60 meters long, and the uh, generating capacity, it takes about four meters cubed per second and is somewhere around 150 kilowatts. So if you go to the next slide. Uh, the main thing that kind of kicked off this EA, and I think the main thing to kind of focus on for background and context is during the flooding events of 2019, uh, Burgess Dam experienced an overtopping event, which essentially means the water was flowing over the dam in an uncontrolled way. Um, so Burgess Dam itself relies on the Bala dams uh, for its spill capacity, but because those dams were either at capacity or um, were unable to handle the flow, water raised up above the design level for the dam and started flowing over along the side. You can see the picture in the slide here was some of the washout that was caused. You can actually see some of the grounding wire uh, around, the, uh, around the facility, which um, led to a dam safety review being conducted, which was conducted by myself and a couple of my colleagues. So if you flip to the next slide, um, we basically looked uh, as a dam safety review does at like the overall function of the dam and how uh, essentially how safe is the dam with respect to its functioning as a power generating facility, as well as to the greater sort of um, public good. So the main things that came out of this was as there was an overtopping event, um, when you look at the uh, design flood levels, Burgess actually is below that level, which explains why it was spilling. So um, we need to be able to improve the facility to handle higher water levels, especially with, uh, you know, increasing events like this becoming more and more likely in the future, having the ability to retain higher water levels is very important. We also noted that the infrastructure for the dam was, was old. The uh, Burgess Dam was built uh, close to, I think almost a hundred and some odd years ago. Uh, so it, it's an old structure and it needs some, uh, some TLC. So when you combine those kind of recommendations from the dam safety review. And if you want, uh, Ken has a copy of the report, you're welcome to, uh, to go through it. Um, in order to kind of put these in place, the idea was to then start an EA to kind of create a transparent process where we could engage the public and, and, uh, and get people on board 
with the uh, with the rehabilitation to meet the uh, recommendations of the dam safety review. So if you go to the next slide, I'll just briefly summarize the problem statement. Um, you can read it there, but essentially because of the 2019 flooding event, uh, we determined that there were some safety concerns with respect to dam stability, as well as the capacity. And that if the dam were to fail, it would result in a significant loss of water control uh, upstream affecting Lake Muskoka and its residents, and could also significantly affect the people downstream along the Moon River. And that's the reason why we're looking to start this EA to come up with a plan for uh, replacement or rehabilitation of the Burgess One Dam. So if you go to the next slide, um, the alternative solutions that we came up with uh, per the EA process was number one would be to do nothing to leave the dam as it is. Uh, number two would be to rehabilitate the dam, but remove the power generation aspect. So essentially the dam becomes a, a passive water control structure. Number three would be to rehabilitate the dam and then also rehabilitate and upgrade the powerhouse itself, including the continuation of power generation. And then number four would be complete replacement of the dam uh, like in situ. So if you go to the next slide, we, uh, I put together a presentation that we put on the Engage Muskoka Lakes website. And uh, we, we held a virtual um, public information session and we also put out a questionnaire and you can see sort of the results of the questionnaire from the people that responded. Uh, largely the option number three, which would be rehabil excuse me, rehabilitate the dam uh, and the power generation uh, was the most uh, popular choice. And generally speaking, uh, as far as the comments were concerned from people, people's feedback, um, power generation, if it was considered economical was, uh, largely supported. People generally supported the fact that Burgess was a, a green energy uh, generation facility through hydroelectric power. Um, big concern was to fix the safety issues of the dam. And then another major concern was to ensure that water continues to run uh, regardless of the outcome through the tail race, as it can become quite stagnant and uh, can be a bit of a, not only an environmental issue, but also like a, a bit of a, an eyesore and, and it can smell according to some of the uh, neighbors. So that was another major concern that was brought up uh, numerous times. So if you go to the next slide, uh, we performed a uh, cultural heritage evaluation report that was done by Horizon Archaeology. Uh, they conducted a site visit in May of 2021. And the findings uh, you can see are in the slide here. So essentially Burgess Dam meets the criteria of being included in the Ontario Heritage Act register. The facade and shell of the dam should be preserved if possible, um, as there have only been some minor modifications to the exterior of the building. Uh, however, the interior of the building has been modified beyond any sort of historic or significant value as it has been retrofitted and modified numerous times throughout its sort of uh, ownership and its tenure. And that the, uh, the, the one of the original of the two turbines, one of the original turbines should be preserved as much as possible, either in place or perhaps as some kind of a, uh, uh, for a cultural or historic purpose, like a display in a local museum, something like that. Uh, as another part of the EA, if you go to the next slide, we did an environmental impact assessment. Uh, this was conducted by Tulloch in the spring of, uh, of 2020 as well. And uh, the main summaries, I suppose, uh, that came from that EIA was that there is um, potential fish habitat uh, in, in the area, uh, there was spawning habitat for walleye and white suckers that were observed uh, downstream of the dam, particularly in the tail race area. Uh, that any uh, vegetation removal or clearing uh, should be outside of the periods of the general nesting periods for birds. And that uh, any in-water work would require DFO approval. Um, and it must be isolated uh, with, with fish salvage and uh, that the you know, fish timing windows should be uh, adhered to for any project that might uh, involve the rehab of Burgess Dam. So the next facet that we did to kind of look at the problem, if you flip to the next slide, is a turbine uh, mechanical and electrical assessment. We retain Norcan, uh, who are a mechanical and electrical firm that deals specifically in kind of small um, power generation equipment. And so one of their uh, engineers came out and took a look at the site 
uh, and came up with some general recommendations on sort of the existing uh, existing state of the of the facility and roughly uh, some ballpark kind of budgetary pricing on on replacement for new equipment. So generally speaking, uh, the site was found to be and fair to sort of poor safe condition. Uh, the headgate and trash racks, which were recently upgraded circa 2012 by Chris Power, uh, were in good condition. The original Francis turbine, which was also the one that was mentioned in the heritage report, has surpassed the life expectancy. Um, and while they typically kind of run to fail, it would be considered like an, an old turbine that's kind of beyond uh, what would be expected of its, of its life expectancy. Uh, they did recommend if we were to uh, refurbish or uh, upgrade the turbines that uh, further detailed inspection would be recommended, including uh, a review of the internal parts as this was kind of a cursory review for budgetary purposes. So it was an external review, but they weren't actually able to get in and take a look at the various you know, mechanical pieces of the turbine. An approximately $800,000 investment would be required to replace the uh, existing turbines with a new uh, setup. Uh, and that the replacement might look from changing the two turbines, which are currently in there, to a single sort of Kaplan style turbine, which would be uh, a little more cost effective and a little more um, uh, efficient, according to the guys at Norcan. And that lastly, if new equipment were to be installed, you could expect about a design life of around 50 years uh, of operation out of that new equipment. So if you go to the next slide, we did. Uh, an economic analysis that kind of looked at the return on investment uh, if power generation were to be continued to see, again, it seemed that uh, particularly with public interest, uh, if power generation could be considered economical, that it would be the preferred solution. So we kind of took a look at what that return on investment might look like and what kind of, uh, if, if it would actually be economical to continue generating power. So based on the DSR, um, the conceptual civil costs were about $775,000. Uh, if you add the turbine replacement of $800,000, you have an approximate capital cost of 1.5 million. And then on top of that, we also added about 20% of the annual revenue uh, that the turbine would generate to be put back uh, into maintenance costs on an annual basis. There would also be about $15,000 a year allotted to just general dam maintenance. So that would be like upkeep of the, the civil structure, you know, making sure that the vegetation is being managed around the dam. Uh, if they need to, uh, you know, maintain other aspects of the powerhouse, whatever. Um, and then also $15,000 every 10 years for turbine maintenance. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see some uh, tables. And we basically took a look as well at the environmental data um, that basically when the operating levels of Lake Muskoka and the head pond are such that Burgess can generate power. And so we kind of created a conservative average and optimistic uh, number of operable days, which can be converted into a kilowatt hour based on the four meters cube per second that Burgess is allotted under the um, Muskoka watershed agreement. And then we also took a look at a few different uh, rates just to kind of look at, uh, again, our, uh, the rate for hydro is highly dependent upon the uh, agreement with each different facility. And those agreements are uh, obviously subject to change as things happen. A typical sort of hydro rate uh, that we're seeing in Ontario right now is about eight cents a kilowatt hour. And then we kind of scaled it as well, just to, to kind of show you um, I guess as a bit of a sensitivity analysis for what the different hydro rates would reflect to an annual rate uh, generation, uh, an annual revenue generation, and then what that would look like on a return on investment for that $1.5 million, including the maintenance costs along the way. So again, if you kind of bring your attention to that eight cents on the left there, you'd have an optimistic annual generation of about 95,000 bucks a year or conservatively about $50,000 a year. Uh, which then would turn into a return on investment of between 22 and 40 years, uh, which is within sort of that span of the 50 years of the uh, overall um, of the overall lifespan of new turbine equipment based on Norcan's report for sort of a 50 year design life. So we kind of took all these different factors and if you flip to the next slide, we put it in uh, to a various like a, essentially an evaluation matrix that was weighted. 
Um, and you can see the weightings on the left uh, with, you know, highlight obviously being public safety being the most important. Um, and then yeah, kind of scaling uh, respectively. And so based on the options, the, the most uh, preferred option from the evaluation matrix would be option three, which is to rehab the dam and rehab the powerhouse based on the economics, the public feedback, as well as um, the overall safety of the dam. Rehabilitating the dam is, uh, in our opinion, kind of a must. And then the power generation uh, could be considered economical under favorable conditions uh, based on our analysis and, and uh, the turbine assessment at this point in time. So last but not least, if you go to the uh, final slide, we kind of, I kind of summed it up in some general recommendations. Uh, so overall, based on public input, option number three, which again is rehabilitate the dam and continue uh, and rehabilitate the power generation, continue power generation was the most popular. Uh, for the cultural heritage report, option number three was considered favorable while maintaining the facade uh, so that you can keep sort of the original heritage of the building and then uh, putting that sort of uh, uh, original turbine on some kind of a display could be a, a good cultural thing. Uh, for the environmental impact assessment, maintaining water flow was very important. An option two or three of rehabilitating the dam of the rehabilitating the dam and either continuing to generate power or not continuing to generate power as long as water is flowing through that it's not going to negatively impact any of those spawning grounds within the uh, within the tail race could be considered uh, feasible. Based on the condition assessment uh, option three, there is a financial case for continued power generation and given appropriate investment care and maintenance over the years. It's something that uh, is feasible. And then that was sort of uh, continued on to the economic analysis where, again, a conservative uh, with a rate of about eight cents a kilometer, eight cents a kilowatt hour uh, under a conservative um, case of operable days, your payback is looking at about 40 years, which is within the design lifespan of, of 50 years. Um, so there is an economic case in recouping sort of that initial investment. It is feasible. So option three, again, would sort of be from an economic perspective, a feasible and, and preferred option. So I think the main thing is that we do need to address the dam safety issues uh, to prevent overtopping or possible failure. And that rehabilitation of the dam can be done with either option two or option three. But I think uh, sort of the do nothing option is kind of not really feasible because there are safety issues with the dam that need to be addressed. Uh, and probably rebuilding the dam or replacing it would be economically uh, infeasible considering that the dam with proper rehabilitation should be able to uh, should be able to extend its design life uh, to a reasonable time period and so uh, option two or three is kind of the preferred options and overall, if you look at sort of the public and stakeholder feedback, as well as uh, general consensus of the public and the general consensus of the various, um, you know, studies that we've performed, um, option three would kind of be our recommendation to, to move forward as far as a, a preferred alternative solution for the EA. Um, yeah, I think that kind of sums up what we've done to date and kind of our general recommendations. So. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to field them or, or I'm sure Ken would be happy to field them as well. Um, so thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it very much. Okay, we're, everyone's back now. Thank you very much for that uh, uh, report. Um, and I'll turn it over to Council for questions. Councillor Zavitz. Thank you, through you. Uh, and I suppose to Director Becking um, or, or perhaps to you, Mayor, you've been involved in water levels for, for years and years and years. Um, my question would be, first of all, you know, how did we get in the water control business? So given the history of it all, um, why wouldn't we do, have we, have, sorry, have we communicated with the uh, MNRF uh, on this particular water uh, device, if you will, water level device? And um, what do they say about it? Director Becking. Um, thank you, Mr. Your Worship. Uh, MNR is aware of the of the uh, the project, uh, and uh, I believe they have been circulated. I'm not aware of their exact comments, 
Um, that having been said, uh, if status quo is is the objective, then they're uh, not going to have any significant concerns. It's only when we deviate from status quo that that uh, there becomes an issue. Um, with respect to to the councillor's first question, um, we got into this business by default. Um, there's a long and sordid history, but essentially the dam was constructed by the Burgess family in 1917. It was abandoned by the Ontario Hydroelectric Commission in the 1950s or 1960s, as I understand it. It sat dormant for many years and was resurrected uh, as an economic development generator in, in uh, uh, the late 1980s. Um, and we've maintained it ever since. Um, so that, that gives you sort of the thumbnail sketch of how we ended up where we are. Um, the, the alternative, as, as Mr. Giles has pointed out for you, is either we maintain it in its current state with hydro uh, generation as, as a feature, or we convert it into a passive control structure and continue to uh, allow it to operate uh, on, the, on a reduced basis. Um, and essentially that is the, the decision before you. The preferred alternative as has been indicated is, is to um, maintain the generating capability of the dam because it produces a, a uh, income stream that will in the future support future uh, repairs and maintenance of, of the dam. But again, that, that is uh, something that is uh, up to council to decide. Okay, thank you. Councillor Jagowitz. Uh, thank you, Chair. I have, I have several questions and comments. Uh, uh, the first one is, um, this is the first I've seen any uh, numbers. The slides weren't in our package. So I wonder, could we be provided copies of that presentation after the meeting? If, if that's okay, because those, uh, those numbers were not in our, uh, our package. It will be. They're also on the supplemental agenda that was distributed. Oh, are they on the supplemental? Okay, then that's my uh, my error. I will have to look there. Uh, secondly, I didn't see in the presentation an overall cost of options two, three, and four. I know what, what one is, it's zero. So uh, maybe you could allude is that uh, to see what the relative costs for two, three, and option two, three, and four were. And then a lot of weight seems to be put on community engagement. Just remember that was 26 people that responded. That's not a high level of community engagement. Um, the, the other issue is, um, has there been any consideration to what role this will play in the next flood? It, it's my understanding that in the last flood, and, and I may be incorrect on this, but it was not possible to pass water through this dam because it's all being funneled through the uh, generating plant. And I, in this proposal, I see the same thing. Would one want, not want to give some consideration to if it's going to be rebuilt, to having it play a role in that by either being able to hold back water or release water? Um, and, and I guess what I'm trying to say is that it seems to me we're being asked today to make a decision and approve option three. I'm certainly not ready to do that. There's a lot of unanswered questions. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Director Becking, I'm not sure if you wanna comment. The one question, I, and I'm happy to answer myself because I have been very well involved with all things flooding over the last 12 years. Um, regardless of whether this passes water or not, we can flood out the lower portion of the Moon River. Uh, the, existing Bala dams without Burgess one can pass more water than the Moon River shoots and the Big Eddy can handle. So I'll just, I'll leave it at that right now. So this could be stopped up completely and not affect lake levels on the Moon River and or Lake Muskoka. Director Beckin, do you anything you want to add? Um, I, the mayor is, is, uh, quite correct in his, his assessments. Um, the uh, Burgess One Dam has been allocated four cubic meters a second out of uh, what normal operating flows are something in the order of 300. So we're, we're a, 
just slightly above 1% of the flows. Uh, nothing turns on, on whether this dam passes its full or partial flow. Um, I would refer uh, the councillor's question with respect to cost to Eric. Eric, can you give uh, sort of a very quick summary of the capital costs associated with each of the four alternatives, please? Yeah, sure. Um, so obviously do nothing is do nothing. So essentially zero other than what you're currently doing to maintain the dam, which I think is largely being done by your uh, VC. Uh, option two would essentially be the civil upgrades, uh, maybe a little bit more of consideration for uh like these were sort of conceptual numbers, so they may change a little bit, but you'd be looking at roughly, uh, you know, $775,000 because you would essentially not be removing the power house. There may be some additional costs that would need to be added uh, to the, um, uh, to actually like take the, the turbines out as you'd need to essentially turn it into a passive water control structure. So whether that be stop logs or, you know, a low flow uh, pipe or something like that, that would convey flows. So getting the turbine equipment out might be a bit of an additional cost, um, but you'd probably be looking at somewhere around what the civil upgrade costs would be. And then replacement of the dam would be very expensive. I think uh, if you were to put a number on it, when I was talking with Tim and uh, Director Becking in his report, you're probably looking at somewhere around $5 million of investment. Uh, however, that could be more depending on sort of what, um, what, what, how the re replacement of the dam were to take place and, and kind of what that looks like. But for a budgetary figure, I think around 5 million bucks would sort of be what you're looking at. Yeah. Okay, thank you Just for that. To round out the picture your worship the recommended uh, alternative is about 2.2 .2 million dollars uh it's supplementary yep 2.2 .2 is option three is that what you're saying it's not one that is correct your worship it's it's 2.2 .2. now just just uh right now i believe we lease this dam to, to uh someone for 1500 a month or something to that i, I maybe let's not mention the number is it the intention for the municipality to operate it? And have those operational and administrative costs been included in the, in the uh, payback numbers? Director Becking. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, as, as the councillor alludes to, um, the dam is currently leased to a, a, a private company to run um, for the township. Um, we recover uh, a, a small uh, revenue stream on a, on a monthly basis. Uh, the um, lease is a 10-year lease, and that lease comes due for renewal uh, in 2022. Under the, there are terms and conditions on the, under the lease that deal with the issue of major repairs and replacement. Uh, which puts the onus on the municipality for those costs. The answer to the question, uh, Your Worship, is that it's up to council to decide what the future uh, operating model looks like. It could be, uh, it, there's no question that the township is going to be responsible for these rather sizable capital costs. It's then up to council to decide whether or not they choose to operate it uh, themselves, or lease the facility back out to to a uh, another company. There is a third option, which is outlined in in my report to you, which uh, suggests that there may be the possibility of divesting ourselves of the uh, of the asset and um, allowing somebody else to to bear that that cost, uh, recognizing, however, that we are also giving up our, our rights to the four cubic meters a second. And we are also um, placing in the hands of a private sector company um, the ability to adjust flows 
uh, within the, the broad spectrum of what's allowed under the Muskoka River watershed plan. So just Not that that's any significant amount of water, because again, as I've indicated, the, the uh, allowed, uh, the amount of flow allowed to allocated to the township is only four cubic meters a second compared to a, a normal operating flow of something in the order of 300. So it's approximately 1% for, for round numbers. Um, well, thank you, Councillor Jagwitz. I'm going to get you to actually hold because you've actually brought up a couple interesting questions. I want to try and bring some other councils in for this and we'll circle back because I think your one question is, do we actually want to be in the hydro production game? Uh, is really a question that uh, is going to, I think, bubble itself to the table, and then want everyone to chime in back on that. I'll go to Councillor Hayes first, then Councillor Edwards and Nishikawa, and then we can circle back. Thank you, through you. I think my question is for uh, Director Becking. Um, we probably would not be sitting here discussing this had it not been for the flood in 2019. We did receive uh, some funding from the province um, for some of our destruction. Is any of the money that we received earmarked for this particular project? Director, Director. In short, Your Worship, no. Okay, thank you. Councillor Edwards. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Harding. Uh, I have a few. First of all, uh, when I read uh, the uh, report on page 100, and those figures uh, are, are not correct when they said that the um, it, of course, nothing is nothing. That's fine. Uh, the re uh, the rehabilitate the uh, down and remove the power generator. It was one point uh, uh, one million two hundred seventy five thousand or or uh, rehabilitated it uh, one million five hundred seventy five thousand, and that so that uh, you know that that was the figures that I read in the report when I read it. Uh, and that is there any uh, and that government grants for that because if there was a failure of, of that uh, it would devastate the the uh, the uh, Muskoka Lakes obviously and that uh, and if I remember right back between 2010 2014 we had somebody come in to a presentation that they could rehabilitate the uh, the turbines in there. And get about three to four times the uh, power. Has that been checked into? Was that ever done? And that it was a different type of uh, of generator. And I think at that time they wanted to even put them in for for free so they could use it as showcase. And that well, that's it, that option's probably gone. Uh, but I'm I'm not familiar with the captain style uh, in that turbine or that. But uh, seemingly there there was one that that uh, could get us a bit more power for the same amount of water. And uh, maybe the engineer would know something about that. Uh, but I think we can check back to the meetings, but I'm sure it was in, like I say, between 2010, 2014 and that, and I would not be willing to sell the, the, um, the, the rights to that, that, that dam. Cause if you don't own it, you can't control it. So uh, that's one of the things I would do. And I would go for option three. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. I'm not sure if Director Recking or Mr. Giles, if you wanted to comment briefly on some of the, and I think the one interesting question in there is the type of turbine and the maximum generation uh, potential out of it. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, those are the kinds of details that uh, would come out of the design process. Um, the um, analysis that's been done by Tullock has been based on, on a, um, sort of standard level of, of uh, technology. And, um, and so if we want to explore in greater detail, we then need more information in order to be able to make those assessments. So that would come as part of the preliminary and final design uh, stage. With respect to councillor's uh, comments, with respect to costs, he is correct. Um, there is a table, table two, which gives some preliminary costs I would, I would expect that those are hard uh, construction costs and not necessarily reflective of total overall costs. So um, um, what we're trying to do is do a, an apples to apples comparison on the basis of hard numbers. Um, these are order of magnitude um, so that it gives you some indication of where, where you're likely going to end up. Okay. Councilor Nishikawa. 
Thank you. Um, Mayor Harding, I'm a little bit challenged because this is on a council meeting and I, I'm not sure what we're expected to do today because I feel that there's a lot more, I have a lot more questions and things that would be better at general finance. Um, I appreciate um, the speakers before me because they raised a lot of the, the issues that I had had. Um, but just to get to add some, some other questions or concerns, um, I, it, it basically, is there any money being generated today? Because my understanding that that is not the case. Um, and, I, and I know we were always about that $1,500 kind of uh, figure that we used to get. Um, but also, um, I'm more concerned about the neighbors and um, what other, whatever choice that we make, how does it deal with the existing people that are using that pond, I'll call it that pond, uh, in front of the generating station? Um, and have we taken them into consideration and their properties as well? Uh, I, I just, it's a bigger conversation, but I, again, I'm not sure where this conversation is going, but I don't know that I could, uh, I'd like to, this to go back to general finance for sure for a larger discussion. Thank you. Hey, Councilman Shikawa, thank you. Um, and your sentiments are sort of where my own mental was going. I think lots of questions regarding this in particular um, and making sure we have crossed our T's and dotted our I's. The one question I think in there is currently Director Becking, we have an agreement, I believe, with Chris Energy, uh, who we've leased the operations to, and we are receiving monthly income from that, are we not? And if so, just in how much right now? You're correct, Your Worship. Uh, the existing agreement pays us $1,500 per month. Okay, thank you for that. And I think the big issue then for Council's consideration now is we're going to have some significant capital upgrades uh, in this facility. Um, and whether we choose to lease it out or whatever, if we choose to be in the business, I think there is a significant discussion that needs to happen about what business uh, we are in. I appreciate Councillor Edwards' comments not into giving uh, this away and maintaining our own control over our own assets and water levels where possible. Um, before I go back to Councillor Jagowitz, I'm going to go to uh, Mr. Giles, who wanted to speak and chime in a little bit. Eric? Yeah, I think... One thing that I just really want to get across, and this is just based on the recommendations of the dam safety review, is while I absolutely think that um, it's very important to give due process to the financial implications and, and how we do this, at a bare minimum, this dam needs to be fixed. It's an old dam. It's outlived its life expectancy. Uh, there is a real risk to um, having a significant failure if we get another overtopping event. Um, in 2019, it was very lucky that the public works department was able to kind of dig uh, an emergency outlet trench in a lot of ways to help funnel the water around and not be able to get into the powerhouse and start to undermine the foundation of the design. Uh, and I think that it, it's, it's spelled out pretty clearly in the dam safety review that there are a number of like considerable public safety risks. So I do think that while it's very important to make sure that we get a solution that everybody's happy with. I think it is important that the design process does move forward and that at the key of this and the crux of this uh, issue is that this is an old dam. It presents a significant liability to the township and a significant risk to public safety and it, and it needs to be fixed. So that's just something I thought should, um, I, just, I just felt like maybe I didn't get that across in the original presentation and I just wanted to make sure that that was uh, clear. Okay, understood and appreciate that. I'm going to go to Councillor Zavitz first. Thank you, and to Eric's exact point. Um, so, Eric, I'm, I'm surprised to see on a report that considers options. Our first option is do nothing. What What are the implications of doing nothing? I mean, further to your point, if we do nothing, what does that even mean? This thing is going to crumble and, and perish. I'm, I'm surprised it's an option for us. Okay. Doing nothing seems to be... Um, a rather unsafe position for us to take, unless, unless what? I won't answer your question. Well, I, I'm not sure if Eric wants to answer that. I think obviously Director Becking does. 
Obviously, do nothing is theoretically an option, but it's certainly not recommended from insurance and liability and safety of the public. So uh, I think it had to be considered as an option, as one of the options, but Director Becking. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, under the class environmental assessment process, we have to compare all of the, the reasonable range of alternatives to the do nothing, because in some instances, do nothing um, is the preferred alternative because the consequences of doing something are far worse than, than the do nothing alternative. That is not the case in this particular instance. Uh, it is there because we're mandated to have it there, not that it's being recommended in any way, shape or form. Thank you for that. Councillor Jaglitz, uh, do you have a new question, whatever? And then I have an idea for council where we may go with this. Yes, I support uh, uh, the councillor that suggested this go back to general finance. And, and um, these are just a couple of things I think that should come back to that committee. Well, first of all, this is, this is predicated on the fact that we actually own the land that this dam is on because we don't own the water, that's for sure. So I'm assuming, first of all, it is our problem and we actually own the land. So if that isn't the case, would like to know. So really, there's, there's really only two options here because um, we're not going to do nothing and we're not going to spend $5 million. So we either spend around what I've heard around a million dollars and rebuild the dam to make it safe, to make it higher and to uh, mitigate our, our liability and not have any generation. And then it just becomes like anything else. It's a bridge or a road or something that we have to look after in our arsenal of assets. The other option is we spend 2.2 million and we make it a functioning electrical power generation statement. But before I want to vote on that, you'd have to come forward with exactly how it's to be managed. Are we going to do it ourselves? What are the costs going to be? If we go and we sit out, what is our payback? And you just have to do a financial payback. I think the amount of green energy that this generates is, is, is immaterial. At least that's my... Uh, my view. And I assume, uh, Director Becking, you said one thing that I had overlooked. We actually have to leave this dam in its almost current operation, or we have to go through the ministry, don't we, to get approval. Like we can't stop the water up completely or increase the flow. Is, is that correct? So, so we really can't just fill it in, right? Or open it up. Director Becking. Your, your Worship, the, the councillor is correct. Um, we are bound by the uh, Muskoka River Watershed Management Plan um, and we must adhere to it. Um, uh, just to answer one of the councillor's questions, Your Worship, it is without doubt that we own it. Okay. There is no question whatsoever. Uh, this is our responsibility, it's our liability. And uh, to Mr. Giles' point, um, we have to to get on with it. So um, your your summary is is actually an accurate one, and it boils down to, uh, from a staff's perspective, um, do we want a revenue stream out of this or not? It's it it really is at the end of the day a, re a fairly straightforward question. Admittedly, it's it, it's a, a little more complicated from a financial perspective, but at at the end of the day, it's a question of, do we want a, a revenue stream that will help the municipality in the future to pay for its, its upkeep and, and uh, earn its keep, so to speak? Um, and, and that's the question. The, the, how it gets operated, uh, obviously, if it's operated on our behalf by somebody else, they're going to take their cut of the action off the top and give us what's left. Um, so then the economics of it becomes um, far less desirable. Um, uh, as I indicated to you, there are companies that I am aware of who have expressed some interest in the, in the dam and the water rights that go with it. And, um, and um, it may be an option that you wish to consider, but perhaps that's a, a question for another day. Okay, thank you, Director. Um... What I've heard here today, and uh, I agree with, is that we have uh, still a number of questions to be answered. Um, I'm getting a general sense from council that we'd, we would like to uh, defer this and actually refer it, if you will, back to our general and finance committee. Uh, the other thing, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, council, the other thing I'm understanding, there's still some questions regarding uh, the financial sector in this. 
And we do see some numbers included in this report, but uh, as Councillor Everts pointed out, again, page 100 of ours shows 1.5 million as an estimated capital cost, but now it's 2.2 million. I think we truly need to understand that. The payback numbers that talk about a 40 year payback based under our current example, where we are leasing this property out for $1,500 a month, um, it's a hundred and uh, well, based on $2.2 million, it's 111 years before we get a payback because uh, we're not recording the revenue. So I also think we really need to have this council or general finance committee um, weigh in at one point in the future based on a financial analysis and a business case. Do we want to create just a dam? We know that's a stable. We're going to have to own and create a dam to be able to stop water. It's our facility. So what's the basic minimum for that? Um, and then do we want to operate our own powerhouse? Do we want to update rehab? So I think we need to really flesh out many of these financial considerations going forward so that we can make some educated decisions um, and uh, understand that. Uh, I see a couple of councillors have their hands up. Uh, let me just ask a question to those with their hands up. Are you okay at this point just to refer this back with that sort of general synopsis? Nope, Councillor Roberts wants to chime in. Councillor Roberts, I'll let you chime in first of all and then see if we can actually refer this back to General Finance to answer some more questions that have come up today. Thank you, uh, Mayor, for your tolerance. Um, I think that we have two decisions to make. And one is not a decision, it's mandatory. We have five months before a next potential high water situation. What needs to be done between now and five months or what can be done between now and five months to mitigate the risk of, of safety. The other part that we can defer, whether we're going to make money on this or sell it or whatever, is something we can take our time at. But there's a ticking clock as, as came, out, came, came through loud and clear from Mr. Giles. It, there is a potential for a, a, a very big breakage there be it next year, the year after, and I don't think we should wait. I think we should trust the maintenance rate now. Okay, uh, and I understand and agree with that, that uh, there is a, a dam that requires some support, um, but depending on which way I think we go, whether we create it as an operating powerhouse or not, will be differential as to how we fix this. Director Backing, from a timing perspective, um, a stabilization of the dam for next year? Is there a coffer dam that's put in to potentially mitigate risks? Uh, what's your suggestion moving forward? Because I, I do know that I think council still needs to discuss a lot of this as to a path forward. Um, rather than uh, attempt to answer that question today, your worship, I think I want to discuss uh, the matter with uh, Tulloch and get their uh, perspective on things. Um, uh, we know what worked in 2019, um, and that's usually a pretty good place to start. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and uh, notwithstanding Councillor Roberts' questions, I think if there is an issue, uh, we would be bringing it back directly to Council next month if we need to make a decision to be able to move forward. So I think we can leave that in the Director's hands uh, based on the discussion with Tullock. Uh, Councillor Zavitz? Uh, thank you. Through you, I certainly support where you're going with this. My only question would be to staff when it comes back to GNF when it gets there. Uh, I would love to understand more in a more fulsome manner the saleability of the piece. Uh, what are some market conditions? What do we know? A little bit of that bump, that information, as it would be to contemplate, you know, how marketable it is as an asset. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Director Becking, do you have a pretty good idea of what uh, we need to answer coming forward, uh, bringing back to GNF? I do, Your Worship. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, committee, we won't uh, pass this resolution, but I will get a uh, recommendation that we refer this back to GNF with further information. Can I get a show of hands who people who would like to refer this back to GNF? Madam Clerk, you're satisfied. We're going to refer this to GNF. And we've been at this for about an hour and 35 minutes. So I'm gonna suggest we take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back with some more regularly scheduled programming. Thanks.
Okay, council, we'll get everyone to come back. And we've got a couple of other delegates that have joined us here today. We'll go to Rick Hunter, first of all, I believe, correct? Yeah. Schultz and Gibson. I'm not sure if the planner wants to introduce it quickly. Yeah. Mr. Sawyer has joined us. We're back recording. Um, missing Councilor Jagowitz, Nishikawa. Cameras may just be off and Councilor Mazan, but I think we've got quorum and we're going to go on. So, uh, Mr. Sawyer, if you'd like to uh, introduce the uh, first application. And then I also believe Rick Hunter will bring him into the meeting in case he wants to speak to this as well. Uh, Schultz gives an application. Sam? Good afternoon, Your Worship and members of council. Uh, in September, Planning Committee heard application ZBA 2521 and re recommended that the bylaw 2021-83 be approved uh, subject to a minor amendment. The subject lands are located at 1058 Whittings Road, unit number 55. The purpose of the site-specific zoning bylaw is to permit, permit an increased boathouse height on a lot with lot frontage of less than 300 feet. Um, however, the draft bylaw that was circulated with the public notice also contained an exemption to permit an increased lot coverage. But shortly before planning committee in September, the applicant reduced the scope of the redevelopment proposal. As a result, a minor amendment is required to delete the exemption to lot coverage um, from the bylaw. The bylaw as drafted also contains an, contains an exemption to permit laundry facilities in the first story of the boathouse. As planning committee instructed that such facilities would not be appropriate, the minor amendment is required to remove the exemption to permit laundry facilities in the first story. Furthermore, in accordance with uh, planning committee's recommendation to council, the minor amendment is also required to prohibit the construction of a cupola on the roof of the boathouse. No concerns were raised to this app related to this application by either township or district staff or by members of the public. And I have no further comments, uh, but I would be happy to assist with any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, do we have Mr. Hunter joined us today? Or he was going to, there he is. Welcome, Rick. Uh, we will get you to chime in on your application, your client's <clears throat> application. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Um, actually, I, I don't have uh, much to say just to be here more to answer any questions that may come up if, if Council has any. Um, uh, my client has, has reviewed the, the matter, you know, following the, the discussions at Planning Committee and uh, based on, on uh, Mr. Sawyer's presentation that, that we're satisfied with the direction that things are going. Okay, thank you for that. Okay. So, thank Council, you. I'm going to uh, read first and second, moved by Council Roberts, who's with us. Yep, and Councillor Zavitt seconded. Be it resolved that bylaw 2021-83 to amend comprehensive zoning bylaw 2014-14 Schultz Gibson rule 6277 be read a first and second time. Any comments? All those in favor? That is carried, thank you very much. Uh, we do have a minor amendment Mr. Soya spoke about and that is to remove the exemption for lot coverage. Uh, to exclude and uh, define that laundry facilities are not allowed and also that a cupola is not permitted. That was based on a discussion that we had back at our planning committee back in September. I'll read the uh, amendment moved by Councillor Bridgman, seconded by Councillor Edwards. Be it resolved that Township Council amend bylaw 2021-83 Schultz-Gibson and this amendment is minor in nature and does not require further public circulation. Hereby approved prior to third reading and the minor amendment shall consist of the removal of the exemptions related to increased lot coverage and laundry facilities and that a cupola not be permitted. Any comments, questions on the minor amendment? All those in favor? Burke. Thank you very much. Third and final reading moved by Councillor Hayes, seconded by Councillor Jaglitz. Be resolved that bylaw 2021 83, Schultz Gibson, be read a third time and finally passed. Any further comments before third reading? All those in favor? That too is carried. Mr. Hunter, thank you for joining us today. Uh, no questions, obviously, for you. Thank you. Okay. Have a great day. Bye now. Uh, okay, our next application is under McCaskin and Mr. Sawyer, I'll let you introduce this quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. 
in September, a planning committee recommended to council that the uh, bylaw in the name of McCaskin be approved, provided the property and redevelopment be made subject to site plan control. I believe there's a, um, a bylaw on today's agenda for that and um, also subject to a minor amendment. These subject lands are located at 1133 Whiteside Road, unit number one, and the property, this property has frontage on Lake Muskoka. The application was originally deferred by planning committee in June. The initial proposal involved the addition of a second story, as well as an enlargement to the existing first story. And this is uh, to the dwelling. Uh, exemptions were required to permit the proposed redevelopment on an undersized lot and to permit the proposed front yard setback of this second story addition component. After the, de the deferral, the applicants consulted with their neighbors to address concerns and as a result, the applicants came back to planning committee in September with a revised application. The revised proposal now no longer involves the construction of the second story. However, exemptions to the zoning bylaw are still required to permit the proposed enlargement of the first story of the existing dwelling and associated sun deck on an undersized lot. On today's agenda is a bylaw. Um, oh, I, I, uh, that's our uh, site plan control bylaw. That's on today's agenda. And the minor amendment is required to reflect the revised uh, development proposal and to prohibit further habitable buildings on this undersized property. And I believe Mr. Fawner is here today representing the neighbors to the west of the subject property. And I have no further comments, but would be happy to assist with any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Mr. Fawner, welcome. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor Harding, uh, members of council, uh, Stephen Fawner, Northern Division Planning Limited, 109, Meadow Heights Drive, Bracebridge, Ontario, P1L. And I'm representing Tracy Robinson, who is the uh, property owner immediately to the west. I think she may be trying to get on. I'm not sure. I think she was hoping to uh, say a few words, but I'll just be very quick. Um, I did uh, note that uh, Mr. Munts in his presentation indicated that this was all the development that they were interested in. Uh, and if so, uh, we would like to see that uh, tied down if possible. And that being tied down so that uh, like lot coverage height and habitable floor area be tied down to um, basically what they're going to get at the end of this uh, process. And uh, I believe they wouldn't have objection to that. I did provide a um, draft bylaw. I know that uh, some councillors maybe had a bit of concern about that. Um, where parties agree, that's kind of standard practice, certainly in front of the tribunal, the Ontario Land Tribunal, that uh, someone provide a, a draft bylaw. So uh, I did that. I was uh, hoping I was uh, helping out. So I'm just hoping that council will consider that as a minor amendment uh, going forward. Um, that we tie things down. And uh, in terms of site plan control as well, I think you may be considering a bylaw um, at some point. I'm not sure if that's today or not, but uh, just to ensure that uh, there's going to be uh, some buffering along the Western lot line and as well that we see full elevation drawings of the uh, building so that we can again, try and tie down what they're proposing. Um, we'd like to thank the owners. Certainly there's been much improvement uh, to what was originally proposed. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Robinson, I believe you are with us today in the meeting. Let's see if you want to provide any quick comment before we move forward. Tracy? Leave you there. You unmuted. If you can un uh, turn your camera on, that would be appreciated too. I'm trying, Phil. I'm. Uh... <laughs> That's okay. We had technology this issues is, this morning. Okay. I, oh, I don't go ahead I anyway. Can. Anyway, um, I just wanted to thank the council. I don't think I can get on visually. So, um, and, and just reiterate how much I appreciate all of the hard work that you guys have done on this. And um, I hope you do take Stephen's uh, concerns into consideration when you're doing the bylaw. And um, I think that's about it. I just, Wanted to say I appreciate all of everybody's hard work. Okay, thank you for that. And the staff, especially, you know, they've done a really, they've done a lot for this and I appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, I, I will say, I appreciate your comment, and, uh, Mr. Farners, to work with a neighbor um, to try and find some resolve. Um, mm. I appreciate where the McCaskins have come to in this, uh, from where they first started yes. um, and where we've gotten to today. So thank you for yes. that. Um, I'm going to go. 
Tracy, thank you. I'm going to go with our first and second reading right now, and that's moved by Councillor Kelly, seconded by Councillor Mazan. Be it resolved that bylaw 2021-37 to amend comprehensive zoning bylaw 2014-14 McCaskin rule 6226 be read a first and second time. Any comments? All those in favor? And it's carried. Thank you very much. Uh, we have had some uh, minor amendments as uh, recommended by Mr. Uh, Sawyer. Um, and I get maybe Mr. Sorry, just to comment um, in the minor amendments. Mr. Fawner sort of requested that uh, everything be locked down as it is today. Um, we're not requiring a minor amendment at this particular point for lot coverage. So they're not going above lot coverage. Um, they're not going anything beyond. Uh, we are limiting habitable buildings in this regarding the minor amendment. Uh, is there anything else we need to help uh, people move forward? Uh, through you. Um... Your Worship, um, I, I believe that uh, the way that uh, the resolution from planning committee is, is worded is that we're prohibiting uh, further development um, on that property. And uh, that, will, uh, that will address the concerns that uh, Mr. Fawner has raised today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna read the minor amendment. It's moved by Councillor Nishikawa, seconded by Councillor Roberts. Be it resolved Township Council amend bylaw 2021-37 McCaskin. And this amendment is minor in nature and does not require further public circulation and is hereby approved prior to third reading. The minor amendment shall consist of bylaw 2021-37 be amended as necessary to reflect the revised development proposal and to restrict further habitable buildings on the property. Any further comments? All those in favor? Clerk carried. Third and final reading. Thank you very much, Mr. Zavitz, for moving this and Councillor Bridgman for seconding. Be it resolved that bylaw 2021-37, McCaskin be ready third time and finally passed. All those in favor? That too is carried. Thank you very much again, uh, Tracy and uh, Mr. Fawner. Thank you for joining us today and uh, expressing your concerns. Um, appreciate it. So thank you. Okay, um, we've got a couple bylaws uh, moved by Councillor Chicago, seconded by Councillor Roberts. Be it resolved the following bylaws be read at first, second, and third time and finally passed. Bylaw 2021 163 to designate site plan control, part of lot three, concession 12, part one, plan 35R 11666 Medora, defend, uh, does, defend, de, defacendes. I totally just screwed that up. I apologize. Rule 47425 and bylaw 2021 166 to designate site plan control concession F part lot 20 and part road allowance Medora McCaskin rule 622 and 6. Councilor Mazan, you have a question. You do not have a question. It's my iPad again. Sorry about that. Okay. Does your iPad have a question? <laughs> it does not. You've all heard the resolution. All those in favor? That is carried. Thank you very much. Um, Council, we're gonna move into closed session at this particular point. Resolution moved by Councilor Edwards, seconded by Councilor Hayes. Be it resolved that closed session convene at 3.02 p.m. for litigation or potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the municipality or local board, three Ontario land tribunal matters, and litigation or potential litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting municipality or local board, and advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose, and that's one matter pursuant to section 239, number two of the Municipal Act 2001. All those in favor? That is carried.